Hi, I'm Phil. Welcome to Holy Habitus. Today I'd like to talk to you about the book of Esther, a wonderful little book tucked away in the heart of the Bible. And it's a fascinating uh, read. Uh, I think one of the most fascinating fa features of it is, is that God is not mentioned. Not once. Not once is the God of Israel named directly. It talks about the people fasting, doesn't talk about them praying though, although that's implied. And it seems as though this has been the direct strategy of the writer um, to not make explicit reference to God in order, I think, to draw attention to the implicit presence of God behind the scenes, the agency of God which permeates um, the secular zone. Why would he do that? Well, the Jews are, are in, in exile and they are under a pagan king. They're surrounded by a huge melting pot of nationality, their ethnicities, religions, gods, um, people jumbled up between India and Ethiopia in this massive empire, this new world order. And, um, and they're surrounded by people who don't know the name of God, who don't honour the name of God, who don't believe in his agency. And the writer seems to be drawing attention to that, or, or rather um, not referring to the name of God in order to draw attention to how God is at work behind the scenes. And uh, as you know the story, Esther, a Jewish girl, um, is, it rises from obscurity to great prominence as the wife of the emperor. Kind of inexplicable leap and uh, suddenly finds herself uh, at the top of the pyramid, as it were. Um, at the same time, her uncle Mordecai um, refuses to bow down to Haman the Agagite, who is uh, one of the top officials in the land, and he makes a plot to wipe out the Jews, completely annihilate them throughout the empire, and gets approval for, the, for this from the king, who doesn't know that his new wife, Esther, is a Jew herself. And, and Mordecai, um, Esther's uncle comes to her and says this in the in the right in the heart of the book in the middle of the book chapter 4 verse 13 don't think for a moment that because you're in the place uh, in the palace you will escape when all other Jews are killed if you keep quiet at a time like this deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place but you and your relatives will die who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this and so you see even though God is not explicitly mentioned his activity and agency is implicitly mentioned because Mordecai can say with great faith if es Esther doesn't act to save the Jews relief and salvation will come from some other place because God will make it happen a and actually that Esther has this incredible privileged position precisely because God put her there he's set the board in order to act and save his people a and so we see that in a secular zone uh, in a place where people don't recognise the agency of God, nevertheless, the agency of God is present. It permeates all things. Um, and it doesn't always help to talk about a secular environment because, uh, in contrast to the spiritual, because actually God's spirit permeates all things and, uh, and is steering events, nations, rulers uh, and history itself. And there's a timeliness to that, that God is, is, in, is in the timing. And so there's a challenge there to Esther that she needs to um, recognise that she's been placed where she has to act and she needs to respond and align herself with the purposes and the activity of God or else she'll find herself on the wrong side of that with disastrous consequences. But there's also an encouragement there um, which is delivered to us as exiles in a secular environment that actually God is, is on the move and God is at work and even when everything looks stacked against the people of God as it did during the time of Esther and Haman the Agagite, yet God is still at work and he has placed the pieces on the board deliberately and in time, in his perfect timing, he will act.